Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is having a good morning. Now, something that came up Wednesday night, and I'm just going to mention it briefly here, and I'll mention it again this coming Wednesday night. Sanctify and consecrate. We were trying to decide which is which, what does which one mean, and all that. And it comes up in the Bible all the time. So sanctify, the difference is sanctify can mean consecrate. If you'll notice one of the definitions here, set apart or declare holy, de dedicate that to God. That's what sanctify means. Now sanctify also means to make something legitimate or binding, as in marriage before God, you know, in a religious sense. And then also to cleanse or to free, you know, make free from sin, to purify, which is like, the Lord's blood sanctifies us by cleansing us of our sins. And also, the second one, I mean, this last one here says cause to be or seem morally right or acceptable. That seems very much as to me as being free from sin. And it's still basically the same thing in my eyes, mm -hmm. meaning that the Lord's blood again cleanses us and sanctifies us and makes us morally right or acceptable. It's not anything we do, but it's what he's done for us. Now, consecrate really only has one definition that I could find, and that is to dedicate something as sacred or dedicate it to a divine purpose, meaning we're consecrating. Can't think of a good example now. Oh, OK, well, we consecrate this time. We dedicate this time to God to come here and study his word and learn. So. That's an example of consecrating. And that's also could be used in the first sense of sanctify because we set apart this time for God. But in these other meanings of sanctify, it, it has more meanings than just consecrate. So just wanted to mention that. We'll mention it again on Wednesday night because that's where it's really in context to what we're studying. But I wanted to bring that up because I know that's uh, something we were looking at. Okay, here we go. So now we're ready to look at Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, here in chapter 10, if we look at the summary, basically showing that the uh, animal sacrifices of the law were insufficient, while the death of Christ as a sacrifice fulfills the will of God and perfects those who are being sanctified, perfects us, right? Not that we're perfect, but through Christ, we can be made to be perfect in his image. So, also uh, mentions here in the summary a threefold exhortation based on what Christ has done. And is followed by the fifth of six warnings. Remember, there are various warnings as we read through Hebrews. And this one is against despising God's grace with willful sin. And then they give us the points to ponder, which very much go with that summary. And if we look here at the review questions, you know, the main points of this question, uh, I'm sorry, the main points of this chapter are what we really just discussed, right? The points to ponder, the main points about Christ's sacrifice being superior to animals. So I don't really want to make that a question because it's kind of redundant after we go through that. So I'm going to bring us down. And we're going to read the first four verses. Let's try to break this down a little bit. We're going to read the first four verses, and we're going to look at question one. So Hebrews 10, going to look at the first four verses. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then... Would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So that's the first four verses. And if we look here at question number two, which is what we've move down to why were animal sacrifices insufficient they couldn't take away sins right they couldn't they couldn't take away sins they couldn't make 
the people that, that are making the sacrifices, they couldn't make them perfect, right? They couldn't make them perfect. They were only temporary, too. They were only temporary because they were done time and time again, right? They were done year after year. And the practice of doing those sins, right? That, I mean, of doing those, I'm sorry. The practice of those sacrifices actually reminded them and made them conscious of sin over and over, right? Because had it had those sacrifices been perfect, like the, the writer is saying here, uh, once purified, they wouldn't have needed those sacrifices anymore. That would have been done. They, they would have only done it one time. But that's not how it works. That's not how it worked for them at that time. That's not what happened. So let's read down. Unless, does anyone else have anything on that worth any more? All right, so I'm going to read down the next uh, verses. We're going to go down to verse 9. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Now, of course, the he that we're referring to there is Jesus. So in question three, in coming to do the will of God, what has Jesus done? He established the new, right? He established the new covenant. This is a longer chapter, which is why I'm breaking it down like this. He took away the first covenant. He ended the uh, first covenant, finished it, and then established the second covenant. That is, that is indeed what we're what we're looking at, and what the writer here is referring to. All right, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> To question four, we're going to read down to through verses 14. So I'm going to start here at 10. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering. There's that word again. We will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now that is the end of verse 14. And we want to look at our question four. So what distinguishes Christ's sacrifice from those of the Old Testament priests? The priest had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, and Christ didn't have any. Well, that's, yeah, that's one thing. He, he offered himself as our sacrifice. Right, he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin, and he did not need to offer any sacrifice for himself. That's, that's part of... Does anybody have anything else? Right. His offering is one sacrifice for all time. It is an eternal offering. Did you have something else, Eddie? No, that's what I was going to say more about. Okay. So his offering was one sacrifice for all time. And his sacrifice, his offering, the Lord's offering, actually makes us perfect through his sacrifice, not again, not because we're truly 
you know, in and of ourselves perfect through, through him. Capable of perfecting those being sanctified. It perfects us. It makes us better. I'm not saying that, uh, that of course, we would truly be perfect. Yes. Sometimes the word perfect means complete. Right. That's right. It does mean complete. And a lot of, a lot of times in these translations, it does mean complete. So, and the Lord does complete us. So that's a very good point to think about. He completes us and brings us back to being, his sacrifice really brings us back to being the way we should have been always. If you remember how Adam and Eve were in the garden, in a way he has restored us back to that type of relationship with God where we can have a relationship with God. Does anybody have anything else on that? Yes? I don't think we realize how close God is to us. I, <laughs> I know this is no. that's a little, well, but it isn't off either. This no. is exactly what they're talking about. Right. Sometimes we, well, as we go through our daily lives, a lot of times we forget how close God is. And yet he's just one step away. He's just right there with us all the time. And that is sometimes that really gets to you. And most of the time we're just going on la la la, you know, in our everyday lives. Yeah. Yes. We go along and it becomes very clear. Yes, we go along in life and we don't we don't remember, we forget as we go through like when I'm sitting and doing my work, let's just say I'm sitting and working every day. A lot of times I'm not thinking, well, God is really right there with me. He is right there. He is. But he is. I don't think I don't think a lot of people understand that. Right. It's an important thing to realize, and it's it's hard for us to grasp that sometimes, that he is always with us, and the Lord is always near. Like, I think Paul says that uh, over in Philippians. It's just like one little, the Lord is near. But, but also, the Bible tells us in many places that God is with us. Anything else? Okay. Because I, I don't feel like any of that is off topic, really. It's, it's important that we realize and think about these things. This is what, was, what I was thinking about. Right. And that's, that's good. That's what these classes are for. Yes? It's a good thing to remember that Christ, God, is always with us and close to us. We're the one who find a way to separate ourselves. We are the ones that stray off, right? We're the ones that wander. We wander off. We get distracted or pulled in different directions. Yes, Pat. I know as children, um, we get comfort knowing that our Father is, is taking care of us. And so <laughs> to know that He's there gives us comfort to know He's there. It is. It's very comforting to know that God is there for us, with us, that he's available to us. That's very important things to, to know. I think that's very helpful. It's helped me through some rough times. I'm sure it's helped some of you through some rough times. Does anyone have anything else? Well, I will make, uh, when I, I went to Walmart the other day, I wanted to uh, get my two girls out. Uh, shirt with Valentine's on it mm -hmm. for their party at school. Well, I found one where their rest, there was uh, an other uh, shirt there, but they, there was only one that was size for the one girl. I did, it didn't have the, the other one. I thought, well, I can't buy one, not the other. All right. I walked on down the aisle and up on a rack. There was one uh, shirt, Valentine shirt, and it was the other girl's size. <laughs> myself. God's looking after me. <laughs> yep. You know, even in the little things, God does supply. Yeah, so it, that's it can be. Just yeah. little things. It yeah. can be. Can yeah. be. You ever pulled up to a really busy, crowded store, all the lots full, and you get that one premium space up front, and you're like, oh, God meant for me to be here now because I've got this good space, and I can go in the store and get what I need and get out, right? Yeah. I mean, that's me, guys, always thinking, I just want to get what I want and get out, you know. But. <laughs> you know, we think about 
credit for all, we're supposed to give God credit for all that he gives us. Yes. But sometimes we forget and do it backwards. We give God credit for the bad stuff, and he has nothing to do with the bad stuff that happens. He allows it to happen, but he does not bring it on. Right. God does not bring on the bad stuff, but but people do want to blame God. And I've been guilty of that in my life where when I was younger and I, yeah, I know. But but when you really study the Bible, you find that he's not the blame. Yes, Judy. But, but sometimes he also puts roadblocks and the things that, to keep us from things, I do believe. Some things that. We but there, he's keeping us from things that are bad for us. Yeah. I can agree with that. Yeah. Now, I do believe that. I believe that yes. God is always looking out for us. He's trying to steer us in the right course. Uh, the Lord, you know, the Lord is our shepherd. Now, what does a shepherd do? He guides the flock around. He tries to keep them out of danger, out of trouble. So I do believe that, yes. And he provides a way of escape when we're tempted. Right. He does. He provides a way, and he tries to get us to come back. You know, if we're wandering off, he tries to get you to come back. If you've strayed off, he goes and finds you. Yeah, all those things. I think we have to be reminded that when we worship God, when there's two or three together, Christ is in this place. Yes. Anytime we gather together, even just a couple of us, yes, Christ is with us. He said he, said he would be. He is. Does anyone have anything else? Yeah, it's kind of awesome to, to think that he's omnipresent because so many times we'll have something come up in our life and it might be two or three things happening on that day that we wish we could be there and we couldn't. And, and I, you stop and think, it's like, you know, I have that problem, but God doesn't. He's always there for everybody, not just me. Right. God is omnipresent. Right. He is everywhere at all times. And it's hard for us to understand that, isn't it? It can be. If we just look at it from our human, limited self, it's hard to understand being everywhere at once at all times. But God is, like he says, his ways is far above us. He's, yeah, and it makes me think of uh, the second coming, you know, that every eye will see the Lord. And it's like, it's almost what? like the omnipresent thing again. Everybody will see him. It is. The world is so big, it's like, you can't comprehend that. Right, but somehow, when he comes back, there's not going to be any, it's going to be a surprise, but there's not going to be anybody that doesn't know. It, everyone is going to know when that occurs. It's not going to be hidden. That's what I was trying to say. You know, it says every eye will see, and that would be evil. Yep. Wow. Yep. Just think about those who are not prepared to see the Lord, just took over bow before him. And yeah. that's be a sad, sad, sad. Those are the ones we should feel sorry for and try to try to help before that time. All right. Let's see. So we were looking at we were looking at question four. I think we're ready for five. So I'm going to read us down uh, from verse fifteen down through verse twenty four. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, Brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, he dedicated that for us, through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So this is 
Well, the question five, what threefold exhortation is based on what Jesus has done? I think verse 22, 23, and 24, where it says, let us, those three there. Okay. Let us draw near. That is correct. Let us hold fast and let us consider one another. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. Those three verses, the 22, 23, and 24, the let us verses, you might say, let us draw near. That's, that's what we're exhorted to do. Draw near, hold fast to our confession, and then consider one another. Make sure that we're being considerate and caring and thinking of each other. Does anyone have anything on that? All right. Okay, verse 25, that is for one thing right here. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, what should we not forsake? The assembly. The assembly. You know, I, to this day, I don't know how people can stay home from church anytime they want to any, and say, well, I have a sore toe, you know. <laughs> I miss coming to church so bad these last two weeks because of my land and wherever I was foolish enough to be when we were very young, hinders me from getting out because I'm old and afraid of it. But I miss it so bad. I don't know how anyone can just not go to church and not miss it. We, we, we do. We miss church. It's, it's really a, kind of a heart condition. When we're not here, we miss church. We don't just miss each other, though that is part of it, but we miss this time that is dedicated to the Lord, to looking at his word. We miss those things. We miss that knowing that we're in the presence. We know that Jesus is here with us anytime we gather. So knowing that we're in that presence, that's important. So many things we do, like taking the Lord's Supper, such an important part of our worship. I don't know how we can just brush it off. That is another, that's another important thing. That's a very strengthening, that's really, the Lord's Supper is really, we do that to remember the Lord, yes, and we thank him for that. But if you look at it largely, it's so beneficial for us. It's good for us. That's why he established that. It's so uh, encouraging and reminding to us of, of what he has done for us. And uh, so when we forsake the assembly, if you think about it that way, if we forsake the assembly, if we are not coming, and like I said, that's kind of a heart problem. It's a, a heart condition where you're just not that interested. You don't want to be there. And I, I'm talking about that. I'm not talking about if you have valid, real reasons. You know, people have health conditions, I understand. But if we are doing that, um, then we're putting ourselves at risk. That's one of the things that strengthens us in our walk. And we're putting ourselves at risk. We could be weaker. Yes, Pat. As I look at it, not everybody will look at it the same way, but to me it seems like it's a willful sin when you don't come to the assembly every time the door is open. I know years ago before we got married, I told Larry, because I was not raised in the church, I said, every time the door is open, we're going to be there. And we were, and we always have been. But to me, it's it's a willful sin when you don't come to services. And um, it's written that we're, that they came together on the first day of the week. And then our elders have said, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And so when you don't come, you're not honoring the, the elders' wishes for you to be here. Well, I'm not sure if I can say with that every time that it's always a, will, a willful sin to not be here. Like I said, uh, there are accidents, there are real medical conditions, there are real problems that can happen. We have to remember that not everybody's as blessed as I am. Not everybody lives, you know, I can walk. <laughs> I mean, and, and I can walk. Not everybody can walk, and some people are in the hospital with dealing with things. And so I don't want to get too and make it too much of a judgmental thing. This shouldn't be this shouldn't be a cudgel that we beat people over the head with. Yes. Excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. 
that. No, you're fine. Uh, the thing is, there are circumstances that each person's life you can look in here even. <laughs> there are certain people that just absolutely cannot see the job himself in the dark. Then there are people who live next door and can walk and they say, well, no, it's too far to go. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> We got to, we got to take these things into consideration. Right, right. Yes. I think of the scripture too. When, um, the Lord's in the garden before he, he is crucified, and his apostles are sleeping, and he said, "You know, can't you just watch for me one one hour? Can't wow. you pray?" And and it's, it gets tugging at my heartstrings. If he says that to them. I feel like he's saying it to me. Can't you come and worship for one hour? Right, right. I'm, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Definitely, we were just talking about this, and it's really important that we do. It's really important that we do gather. Oh, yes. And that we do that as much as we are able and much as we can. And it would be great, you know, for all of us to always be here every time. Like, it would be great if the pews were full every Sunday morning when we come in here to do just just our little Bible study here. Definitely. I mean, that would be, that would be good for any number of people. Not, not because of me, but because of the Bible, because of the Word. So, but, you brought up sin willfully, so we're going to move to question number seven. We're going to segue over to that. Um, so we're going to read verses 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So then in light of that and what we're talking about, if you look at question number seven, what is meant by sin willfully? Knowing to do something and not doing it. Well, yes, knowing to do something and not doing it, that is that is sin too. Okay. Yes? The other thing is knowing that it's wrong and doing it. Yeah. That's you know it's wrong and you purpose to do it anyway. You you say I'm going to do it. And we get stubborn that way about things and we do that. I we do. We know we do. And, and sometimes it's not just a matter of stubbornness. Sometimes there's other reasons that we fall into those traps. We are tempted and we, we do it even though we know it's wrong. Yes. Even though we know it's wrong, we find ways to justify our actions a lot of times. You know, we find a way to justify not it in the church. Right. And, and to get to that point, as far as sinning willfully, if I can be here and I just don't show up, if I can be here and I just don't show up, well, that is, that is kind of sinning willfully going along with what they're saying here. Well, you know, like, this is silly, but I've already looked it up. Daylight savings time starts March the 13th, which means it's 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock on Sunday night. It's going to be daylight enough for me to go come to church and get home before dark. Right. And if I deliberately don't come, then I have no reason not to come except, well, it may get dark before I get home. Knowing the time, knowing I have time to get home, then I'm sending willfully as far as I'm concerned by not coming. Right, and we feel that in our hearts. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you feel that way, then definitely that is, that is, wrong, that is wrong for you, I definitely. And I, I think it's really good. And I don't have to depend on someone else. I better be here because it's the right thing to do. Right. Right. It is the right thing to do, and we should be here if we can be here. I'm sorry. Yes. In uh, verse 27, right? it talks about the enemies of God. If we're deliberately continuing to sin, we're not making a change. Well, yes, if we continue to willfully sin, if you'll notice here in verse 27, if you read 26 and 27 as the sentence it is, if we continue to willfully sin, 
then we would we should have a certain fearful expectation of judgment meaning we will not obtain mercy we will obtain a judgment that we do not want which will devour the adversaries we will be devoured with the adversaries we know who the adversaries are that's satan and, and his ilk because if we sin willfully and this is this is I would imagine this is more chronically over and over, not like you've sinned and you've repented and you're you're doing better or trying to do better. But this is just like a chronic issue that you're never really trying to put aside. You may even say you're repenting, but you're not really repenting because you keep doing it. I mean, at some point, you're just hurting yourself and putting yourself in the enemy's camp. Yes, Abby? Oh, I'm just Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pat. I was going to say... When we do that, we're not just hurting ourselves and hurting God, but the people around us that we're trying oh. to, you know, give a good uh, calling of being a Christian. They see this. Yeah, when when we do that, we're not setting a good example for folks around us. They see that. And that gives that gives Christians a black eye overall and, and really it gives the Lord a, it can give the Lord a bad reputation for Christians to be acting incorrectly and be sinning willfully. That's true. And the worst part of sinning willfully is there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for it. Yeah. Right. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sinning willfully. Right. That's something to be aware of. It's not that we can't repent, but... But it puts us in a bad position with God. It puts us, again, it takes us, when we sin willfully, it takes us away from God. It takes us away from the shepherd, away from our protection. All right, so let's see. I think we can do one more here. So, we talked about the consequence, even though I may not have read that, but we talked about the consequence of, of willfully sinning. So, we're going to move on to question number eight. We'll read verses 29 through 31. Well, actually, I'll just read from 28 through 31. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, again, sanctified, cleansed, and made pure, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I know we're all familiar with that last scene, that last verse. So of what is one guilty when they persist in sin? What are, what are we doing when we do that? Did you have something, Jim? Yeah. Right. We're we're saying what Jesus did is for nothing. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. <clears throat> the sacrifice that He made for me, it just doesn't matter to me. Right. We're yeah. yeah. We're saying it does not matter to me. It's not important to me. It has no effect to me. Like it's turning our back. I'm sorry. It's just turning our back. Right. Well, it's like we're turning our back on him. We're not acknowledging what he has done for us. Does anyone have anything else? So, the verse here says that we are trampling the Son of God underfoot. We are basically, I think, Pat, did you say that a moment ago? I'm just getting ready to say it. 
Okay. So, you know, says we're trampling the Son of God underfoot. We're treating him and his sacrifice like that. I, I can't even, anyway, I can't say that any differently. That's the way it is. And we're counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. So why should one be afraid of this? Our final, our final question. Because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and he will judge us. We will be judged. The Lord will judge his people. That's, that's how it is. And then, of course, we have that warning in verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And our time is complete this morning. I want to thank all of you for your time and your attention.